Here today to discuss user experience and interactivity in ebooks through paper casting, we have John Rudds Villa. John is currently the senior electronic publisher in residence in the Department of Writing, Literature, and Publishing at Emerson College in Boston. He is also working as the graduate program director for the department's new online MFA in popular fiction and publishing. He has been a consultant for Plowshares Magazine and is active in Book Builders of Boston. Please welcome John Rudds Villa. So, a little bit. I guess a little bit more about that introduction because um, at Emerson I'm used to the definitions and then standing over here I'm like, wait, she just said writing literature and publishing which sounds natural to me but I realized the rest of the world is like, what does that mean a department of writing literature and publishing? We don't have an English department at Emerson College. We have a department of writing literature and publishing. Emerson basically said, yeah, so this thing we call English literature, it actually involves writers, literature, as you call it, and publishers, which means it's one of the, it, 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 it's a department that actually believes publishing is part of literature. Um, so it, it's worth mentioning that. It's worth uh, bringing that out that Emerson is unique, since we were talking about special snowflakes, and Emerson is pretty much a special snowflake. Um, we don't have an English department. We have a publishing department, and I am part of that publishing department. And I've been there since 2009, developing digital production processes. So um, I, I've been part of eBooks since about 2007, 2009. I've taught students like Iris um, about EPUB since 2009, and since Iris started the confessional um, vein right now, and we're continuing in the uh, paper uh, crafty confessional vein, I must admit, um, I'm also a little bit burned out of technology. Uh, last year, I got a little bit burned out about technology. Um, Another iBook Pro, great. Another iPhone, another phone, um, great. I don't want to think about this. And I have to think about this as my job. So um, part of my job this week, um, on Monday, I was teaching undergrads about metadata because for the ne rest of the semester, we're doing eBooks in my undergrad class. So I had to talk about Dublin Core. Talking to 19-year-olds about Dublin Core is a unique experience. <laughs> then on Tuesday night, I talked to grad students about JavaScript for the first time. So if you think teaching metadata to undergrads is difficult, let's talk to publishing grad students about loops when they have no idea what a logical loop is. And like, this is how you make things work um, because we're doing web development. So now I get to come back here and I'm going to talk to you about paper. <laughs> That's it. Paper. As I always mentioned, um, we're talking about cheap and effective methods. And paper casting is that. Paper casting is taking your ebook, basically after storyboarding, and thinking about the interactivity. All that good JavaScript, CSS uh, interactivity that you want to add into your new children's book or your advanced ebook. This is how you start. That being said, um, I am going to be talking about interactive ebooks. So I am not going to be talking about accessibility. For once in my life, and believe, and again, the confessional, I feel guilty about this. I'm not talking about accessibility. I'm going to ignore accessibility. But I want you all to understand my non discussion of accessibility doesn't mean it's important. It's just not there. This is EPUB. It's, it's not there. So I don't want to bog myself down into why can't we have accessibility. So I'm going to start, is I'm going to start talking about you. The book designer and design blindness. I'm going to, well, you, me, us. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about being book designers. We know how to design books. We have an insider's perspective. We can sit and often do sit, or at least, okay, I'll, me. Um, I often stand around with other colleagues and talk about fonts, letting, um, how we do layers in InDesign to help uh, production people understand what fonts we want and what happens when um, that guide um, isn't done properly, or hey, what happens when we don't use true type fonts, or hey, um, can I just say, uh, 
local overrides and have people shudder because that's my life. That should be our life. But that's not the user's life. The user doesn't care. And sometimes we forget that. The user does not care about our knowledge. Does it look good? Can I use it? God, that's, as a user, that's, that's all I would care about. Um, I, users not looking at your book and saying, huh, that's an interesting use of word spacing that you've done. And oh, there are no widows and orphans, or there's a bad widow and orphan. They don't acknowledge that. And being within the industry, it's very hard to remember they don't see books that way. And also, when we design, we see the page, not the whole book. We know what the book is. We can close our eyes and visualize the book. Iris just did that. She closed her eyes and can visualize books she's done a year ago. The last thing I want to point out to you to make you aware of who you are, uh, aesthetics hinder usability. Making something beautiful doesn't necessarily make it usable. There's a group of people who understand all of this that you know we're kind of chasing their coattails. Uh, the web design community. The web design community has figured all of this out. But now with EPUB, we get to recreate the wheel. I don't know why we're recreating the wheel, but we're recreating the wheel. So um, let's recreate some wheels. Um, let's talk about what it means to rethink books digitally. So last summer, I got to um, teach a chapbook cl class, um, a digital chapbook class. So the idea was it was a summer class, six weeks. And what were you going to do in six weeks? You're going to make a digital chapbook. Uh, it was open to masters and publishing students and poets. So yes, I said, I'm going to do a digital chapbook with poets. Ebooks are so easy, even poets could do it. That was, that was what I wanted to say. <laughs> and the poets loved it. They're like, yes, I'm going to make my own chapbook. Um, also, and they did. But I had one student, one publishing student, who came to me um, while we were talking about their final projects, and this was her quote. Yeah, so for my chapbook, instead of a traditional table of contents, I want an image where users can click to the chapters based on those images. I just want an image. I don't want text. I don't want chapter one, chapter two. I want an image. This is what she came up with. Do you see all the food? That's your TOC. So that food is your TOC. Every one of those images of food, you clicked on it, it took you to that chapter. Well done. Really pretty. She was so happy. She got, um, by the way, she got it to work and fixed layout. You clicked on those. It worked. Um, and this is, her name is Jennifer Martin. I should mention it's Jennifer Martin. She is looking for jobs. She's graduating. Um, <laughs> This was the agreement. I could use her, her images if I mentioned she, she's graduating and, and looking, as is everyone, but is looking. So this is my agreement to use these slides. But she got this. And you know, if you look at this, you're like, wow, we can do this in EPUB now. Granted, it's fixed layout, and it's just for iBooks. But we can do this now. This can be a table of contents. My problem was, yeah, but the user's not going to know to touch those book, the, touch that food. Um, you know, why would you ever c touch an image to go anywhere? That's not how books work. You look at pictures. You don't interact with pictures. So what we had to do is we had to actually create, and these are her designs, we had to create a little piece of instruction saying, touch the food to go to the chapter. That's the world we live in. Um, our books now need instructions, or we need to create instructions for books. Now just stop and think about that statement. You're going to make things, and you need to inform the user how to use it. So let's talk about this user, uh, the mythical user. And um, the mythical ebook user, I want you to understand three things about users. And again, this is web design. I'm pulling it straight from web design. First off, your reader has a reason for reading the book. I think this is the most important thing for us to remember, because we do not have reasons for managing the books we handle. I mean, if you think about it, it's a, it can be a job. We love some books. We remember some books. 
I could tell you, fond, you know, we can fondly remember that the best book we ever did or, or the best book design we ever did. When I was in publishing, I was in charge of reprints. I handled 400 reprints in five years. I don't remember those books. But some reader out there does remember that book. They bought that book. They love that. Well, they probably didn't love the books I worked on, but they love their books. We forget the books. Second, they have no idea how technology works. We might say, yeah, I have no idea how technology works either. They really don't know how technology works. You know, it's like EPUB's HTML. Really? What's HTML? It's like a website. Really? I thought, like, you know, computers made websites. <laughs> it's not a book. Um, they muddle through technology. They don't know how it works. They don't know you can press things. They don't know that you can do all sorts of different interactions with books. And thirdly, we have to remember, how do you use a book? You turn the page. And I ask every student this in every class. So how do you use a book? And they're like, and I hold up a book. And I have them walk through how to use a print book. Stop and think about it for a few seconds. Try it yourself. Give me the steps of, of a book. And you're like, well, you open the book. I'm like, from what side? And like, from the right, left? That's a ridiculous question. Well, you can't open from the spine. OK, so where do you hold the spine? I also use Japanese books so that when they say that, I bring up a Japanese book and say, now that doesn't work. We know how to use books. Ebooks are not the same. Digital books are not the same. We don't ever stop and think, hey, I can touch that image. Oh, look, there's stuff that I can do now with ebooks. And I'm not talking about reflowable, I'm talking about um, JavaScript within it. So we have ebooks. We have users who are getting these ebooks. We have users who are looking at that and saying, that's pretty. And then, like, touch it. I'm like, I don't touch books. You don't, you know, it's kind of like you don't write within the margins uh, of print books. You don't assume images. You can tap images. One of the th favorite things my students love is I showed them how to do photo captions. So you don't take up space now in ebooks with photo captions. You just touch the photo and a caption appears on top of it and you touch it again and the caption goes away. So hey, let's, dis let's make all of our captions disappear. We have more real estate for our images, but let's not tell anybody that the captions are hidden behind the images. So no one actually knows what the caption is. So that they say, well, what is this? Click it. See what I have to do? You should never have to say, click it. That's wrong. All right, so where does this take us? Where do we need to go? We need to go somewhere that publishing has rarely gone. User research. Um, remember the user? Again, I'm not using reader either, because the reader, no, there's no reader, it's users. <laughs> and we have to do re user research. And quite honestly, um, as I remember publishing, because I've been in academics for a little bit, uh, a, a while now, in publishing, I didn't care about readers. Um, I cared about chains. I cared about bookstores. I didn't care about readers. The readers were the bookstore's problem. We have to care about readers. Uh, or users in this case. We now have to care about users. And borrowing from uh, usability and user research, look at all this great user research we can do. Where does this come from? If you, if you, want, you want this chart, you don't need me. I didn't make this. Um, I borrowed it as a, as a taxpayer of the United States government. I borrowed this from usability.gov. Did you know there was a usability.gov? The government has its own usability site. Think about that if you've ever used a, uh, a government site. Um, but they have their own user research site. Now there's a lot we can do here. There's card sorting. There's contextual interviews. There's a lot of interviewing with people. There is um, our wonderful storyboarding that Iris talked about. There is testing different versions of books, which I'm waiting one day. It's like, now we're going to make two versions of digital ebooks. The first, we're going to AB, we're going to give our testers, half of them are going to get this version of an interactive book, half of them are going to get this version, and we're going to see which book works better. So anyone in production, that should have sent a shutter down your spine. Can you design two books for us, and then we're going to send them out and see which one works better? 
Um, but if you are coming from web design, you're kind of like, duh, that's how you do web design. That's what Google does several times a year. That's what Facebook does. Why wouldn't you do that with your content? Um, so I'm not going to get into the discussions. I'm just going to talk about pro prototyping, um, particularly paper prototyping. So usability testing with paper prototyping. We do it after our wireframes and storyboarding. And Iris comes in and just reminds you about storyboarding. Um, and we also use just paper. We have paper, no computers, no um, devices, just paper. And the reason for this is if something goes wrong, you can make the change right now. A pencil's good, it has an eraser. Um, Sticky notes are good because you can tear them off, throw them away, and start over again. Paper's good, you crumple it up, you get a new piece of paper. We're publishers. Um, if there's something we have in bulk, it's paper. Um, it's also a way that we can literally see how users wayfind around our book, which again is an odd thing to talk about. Users wayfinding? Oh. Users don't need to wayfind. No, you, you go from page one to page two. You go to page three to page four. Everyone knows how to use a book. And this is where I stop, usually, or right now, and would say, do you remember Choose Your Own Adventures? Choose Your Own Adventure books were about wayfinding. You did not go from page three to four. You went from page three to 34 to 122, back to page eight, and then you died. <laughs> That's wayfinding. Because then you go back, and you go back, and you're like, okay, I died last time, so maybe I won't choose to go to the cave this time, and you live. That's wayfinding. If you want to, if you want to visualize wayfinding, um, think about any college campus or any park and the paths that people have walked in the dirt. Because even though there's appropriate co concrete paths, no one uses them. They walk on the grass and they kill the grass. That's wayfinding. It's how users actually use things. As publishers, we've never had to worry about wayfinding. They can use it whatever they want. Print books, they can use it whatever they want. They can tear the books up for all I care. Um, they bought the book. You know, th it's great. They bought the book. We have no other interaction with the user slash reader. After they bought the book, we're done. We've got our money, the author's got our money, the author can deal with them, the bookstore can deal with them. Now we have to worry about it because the user's like, S yeah, so um, your images don't click. Um, I can't read this on my Kindle. Of course you can't read it on your Kindle, but it's about wayfinding and it's about understanding your users. So why? Why should we use this paper prototyping? Well, what am I trying to convince you here? First off, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It's paper. It's markers. It's probably everything you have in your desk right now. You can do usability testing with things you have in your desk right now. And for the past, God, it's about 20 years now, um, research into prototyping, generally done by Jacob Nielsen, Don Norman, and Steve Krug, have shown High fidelity prototype, prototypes, those, those digital designs that you might want to do or um, everyone else wants to do, they find the same usability issues as low fidelity prototypes, otherwise known as paper. Users don't find more errors. Users don't have more problems digital than paper. They hit about the same results. So. Instead of spending all your time mocking up a digital design, putting it onto an iPad, bringing a user in and using that iPad, you can get the same results with paper. Again, I don't see how anyone would argue, well, you can't do that usability study. It's paper. Um, and the last thing about users, they are more willing to tell you what you did wrong on paper. They're willing to look at it and say, yeah, um, you're crazy, this is paper, and you're scrawled on it, and this doesn't work. Where if they look at a nice web design, they look at a nicely designed ebook, they're more likely to say, uh, that looks really good. Good job. Oh, I could never do that. I could never make that ebook, and, and that's amazing. Um, your functionality doesn't work, but that's amazing. I'm not going to tell you your functionality doesn't work because you worked really hard on it, and I feel guilty about telling you how 
what doesn't work, where if you give them a piece of paper and you're like, look, ta-da, doesn't look awesome, they're like, no, it doesn't work, I, I don't understand, why do I press this button? And they will tell you, why do I press this button? Uh, Jennifer Martin, when we went back, I had her work with students, and the students are like, oh, I'm supposed to press that? And she's like, of course you're supposed to press that. Why wouldn't you press that? And like, uh, you don't press images. And like, and it's an image, so I press one image and I get one thing. It's like, she's like, no, it's, it's, it, it, it's 20 images all combined. So that's why I use paper prototyping. So, are you ready to write down what you need to do paper prototyping? You need scissors, <laughs> markers, sticky notes. I prefer post-it notes, but they're trademarked, so sticky notes. <laughs> and a freely available template that you can print off um, from multiple sites online of a phone template or a tablet template. That's what the scissors are for. You actually print out the template and then you cut the template. And the only reason you use the template is so that people can actually see, oh, it's actual size. This is what a tablet size is. This is what a phone size is. This is all you need. So when I say you probably have it in your desk at work, you probably do. This is all you need. So taking these tools, what you do is you pretty much design your interactive features of your ebook using just these tools. So the guidelines I give my students, the guidelines that I think are the, uh, help the most is, first off, use the actual size of the device. So if you're using a tablet, make it a tablet. The nice thing about most iPads and most uh, uh, other tablets, they're about the size of a piece of paper. Phones are a little bit smaller. But again, if you then have to design for different phone sizes, use those different phone sizes. Don't just use one generic smartphone. Choose those different phone sizes because it's going to feel more normal to the users. They're like, well, I use a Galaxy S7 and you've given me an iPhone 6, so I don't know what I'm doing here. You know, but it's paper. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't work the same. It's like, it's paper, okay? Uh, they did, I've seen, and I'm just relating, these are actual quotes I've had in usability testing. Um, on your white paper, anything that's not interactive, you just wireframe it out. Here's where the text goes. Here's where the images go. Uh, if you want a visualization of this, think of Iris' storyboards. You storyboard, you, you pull your storyboards and you put it in. Anything that becomes interactive, that's where you use the post-it notes and sticky notes you create different object states in your sticky notes. So you say, okay, here's, I have a slideshow. Here's my first slide, here's my second slide, here's my third slide. And you layer them so that users can interact with them. The other guideline you need to keep in mind is iterate. Do it once, look at it, do it again. Do it again. Do it again until you think you've got it. Um, it's paper, just throw it out. It, it's, it's very much like free like, I don't like this. Throw it out, start again. And do it quickly. Very much like storyboarding. Storyboarding and paper prototyping should not take a lot of time. And you don't have a lot of time. And you don't have a lot of money. That's why storyboarding and paper prototyping are great ways to understand the user. Now when we want to identify the content, so now we can dig into our content, we can look at our, our storyboards and like, okay, so I've got braising of meat. Let, let's think about that braising of meat. Um, is it one image or is it a slideshow? Let's figure that out. Um, this pretty much follows exactly what Iris did of sorting it out and saying, this is your text, this is your image, these are your movie files, because again, storyboarding, you don't really worry about movie files. You don't worry about quizzes and forms. And we're in, in the age of interactive eBooks. We can make quizzes and forms. Um, we need to break those down. You need to have a quiz, question, answer, response to answer. You need to fill all of those out, because you need to think, how is the user going to, f going to respond? I've got a question, you know, Think about textbooks, digital textbooks. You need to answer those questions. Well, that reader needs feedback whether they answered it correctly or incorrectly. And then, where are you gonna put the instructions? Because this is, again, something we're not familiar with. Yet, your pages are gonna have to have instructions. 
do this on this page, which for designers can just feel horrible. Like, wait, you're asking me to add 12 more words that say click this image? Um, that ruins the design. Yeah, I am asking you to do that. And make it big enough so they can actually read it. Um, so once you've gone through your images, once you've gone through your text, once you've gone through all of that content and split it up and, and said, okay, this is just gonna be white paper, this is going to be um, all the different stuff that I need to use post-it notes for, you can build the deck. And to build the deck, <coughs> you choose those pages. So you go back to your storyboard, hopefully, if you've storyboarded it, or you do storyboarding now, um, but you go back to the storyboard and say, okay, of these 200 pages, 30 of them have interactivity. So let's pull those 30 pages and let's build the deck of those 30 pages. Any interactivity is a sticky note. And we pile the sticky notes on top of each other. So that what happens is when we go to use, test users, we say, here. And what they get is they get a piece of paper with a bunch of sticky notes. And they say, why does this have a bunch of sticky notes? And you sit them down and say, work through it. And like, okay. I tap it, take off a sticky note. <gasps> There's another sticky note beneath it with a different image. We take it off. There's another sticky note underneath that. So that's basically your process. So just to give you an exa some examples of what these look like, I've done four examples, specifically built these last week um, for this presentation. An idea, of, an example of what a checklist looks like. Because again, we can make checklists where they touch the object and it can do a checklist which you know, sounds great. They don't have paper. They don't need a to-do to, to list for the book. It's similar to our traditional books where you can just write in those books. You can tap it and say, I've done this. Um, links, how do you connect to links? What are those links going to look like? A photo with a pop-out caption. So I hit that photo, a pop-out a caption appears. I hit that caption again, the photo reappears. And finally, a slideshow. And I'm going to walk through the slideshow just so you see an example of what a paper prototype looks like. And as you can see, when I talk about low fidelity, um, this is low fidelity. This is Sharpie on white paper with um, a piece of gray paper that's been cut out and a whole bunch of post-it notes. So this is a typical pro paper prototype. And what we have is we have one side, that white side, we have questions to ask, bullet points, what to observe, bullet points, a little pink sticky note that says something happens, blue sticky note, something happens, and two more pink sticky notes that have, say something happens. And this, I've defined those two, um, two things on, on the right that it's buttons. Literally just, they're buttons. Because the user needs to know, well, what are these, what are these arrows? Buttons. And I think most users are like, oh, they're arrows, they're buttons, that makes sense. I'm not getting lost here. And as a user, you don't want them to get lost because once they get lost in the digital world, once they get lost or they are taken out of the experience of reading a book, you're talking about a digital device, you're talking about an iPad. If I take you out of the reading experience of reading an iPad, um, there's about 30 other things on your iPad that, that are calling for you. Did you know um, so-and-so updated Facebook post? Um, have, you, have you been seeing the tweets over there? You know, I can talk to you. There's tweets over there just popping up there. That's a distraction. How do you read when there's distractions? Well, that's why print is wonderful. Um, there's no distractions. We can do the same thing with digital books until we take them to the point where like, I don't know what I'm doing. I better check Facebook. <laughs> I teach undergrads, so I'm well aware of the, if I don't keep your attention, you're checking Facebook. No, I'm not. I'm like, I can see the, again, my undergrads. I'm not, no. I'm like, I can see the phone under the table. Please pay attention. So we don't want to take them out. So what happens is you have your buttons, and you get them to press the buttons, and they press the buttons, and they go from introductions to please sit. And then, oh, okay, so that's a change of state, an object state change. And then press the buttons again, another change. And you can see that the user gets to walk through this. You've spent no money, and they can understand it, and they can at any point, which they will say, I don't get it. Oh, um, so can I use the buttons or can I swipe? 
you know, like, uh, use the buttons. And like, but everything else allows me to swipe. That's where you're like, swipe. That's, you write it down, you're like, and we make it swipeable. And then you say, yes, you can swipe. And then, again, always figuring out instructions. Because what happens here? They could easily ask, so what happens here? I'm at the end of my slide. What happens here? You're done slides. And like, what if I want to rewatch it? Then you say, all right, your last slide should always be like, reset. You should always think about resets. And again, just pointing this out, we're talking about books and we're talking about resets in books. I never thought I'd be up on a stage saying, so you need to reset the book. <laughs> because it doesn't seem right. Like you need to reset that choose your own adventure to go back. No, you just go back to page 47. Um, so that's the prototype. Now we can talk about our users. Bring the users back into the process. Go find a user. And again, Jacob Nielsen says one user is better than no users. Um, and that's, that's fairly, um, that, that's the one, one of the comments that web design and usability experts always say. One user, 100 times better than no users. But what they don't realize is Jacob Nielsen's done enough studies he said, that he's found out five users, that's about the maximum users you want. There's no value after five users. So if you can get five users, great. You're not going to get any fixes to usability after five, or if you are, there are going to be minor things that no one's ever going to notice. So one is great. Five is optimal. But if you can get between one and five, you are golden. And if you want, um, Jacob Nielsen has lots of literature and a nice chart that actually shows um, usability issues identified between one, two, three, and four, and five. And it's pretty much one is, I think, 60% of all usability issues are usually found by one user, and by five, it's 80. So between one and five, you get 20% more um, discoverability of your errors. You can do it anywhere. And what I always suggest for publishers is, this is what interns are for. You take an intern, give them coffee, give them a paper prototype, and say, work through this. And they will say, okay, you're not paying me, but I got a coffee. What does this do? What does this do? Um, and as the, use, as the tester, bring a notepad and extra sticky notes. The notepad is so you can say, want swipe. Wants this changed. This does not make sense to them. They are not touching any images. Make sure they touch images. The sticky notes are for when they're like, uh, maybe you should do this. I don't know how this works. You can just write up a sticky note and put it on the page and say, does this work better? It's iterating with the user. And they can say, yes, it does work better. So that's the process. The walkthrough goes like this. You hand the prototype to the user. In turn, here's a prototype. It's six pages. Work through it. You have them read through the book, the whole book, or the prototype pages. You don't tell them how to read. You let them walk through it themselves. You record how they interact. Are they puzzled? Are they happy? Are they amused? Amused, by the way, good. Smiles, good. Confusion, not so good. Um, then you ask questions. Then you edit on the fly. Hey, the questions you ask are like, so what did you think? Did, did you like the slideshow? Did you like those images? Did, do you think that caption works? And they were like, no, I like the caption beneath. And again, sometimes it's stylistically, I like the caption beneath. So you edit that on the fly. Now, before I close um, and, and talk about lessons learned, I want to give one quick warning to anyone who does this about priming. When I say ask questions, do not ask leading questions. Do not ask, so uh, what do you think about that button? Because what you're basically saying is there's a button on the page. Find the button. Did you see the entire slideshow? No, should I see? And the user's are like, should I see the entire slideshow? I'll go through the entire slideshow. You've told them there's a slideshow. You're not, not going to be out in the real world when there's a slideshow for the dozens or hundreds or hundreds of thousands of users. There's not, never going to be hundreds of thousands of users in iBooks. But the thousands of users who are looking at a slideshow, you're not going to be able to stand over their shoulder and say, click the slideshow. Click the slideshow. So that's why you want to stand back and say afterwards, what did you think? Um, you don't want to say click that or what did you think of that? Because what you're doing is you're priming. 
and you don't want to prime the users. You don't want to make them believe they should be searching for something because they will find it, but they won't find it on their own. And if you need to prime, that's where instructions come in. That's where directions come in. Uh, if you need to, re if you realize there's, there's priming that's involved, you need to put instruction. Click through the entire slideshow. Press image to read caption. That's where priming comes in. You shouldn't do it yourself in the testing phase. So I'm going to finish up since it's right before lunch and I have this nerve of always doing right before lunch. You're hungry and it's like, I'm done, you get lunch. So I'm going to wrap this up with three lessons I've learned. First off, we need to remember interactivity is still unexpected. Books don't have interactivity. Other than pop-up books, books don't have interactivity. Digital books don't have interactivity. Amazon does not have interactivity. So why should books have interactivity? Always provide your user direction. Always give them something on the page that says, click this, do that, um, drag this here, drop that there. And finally, don't overwhelm the readers with with interactivity. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Just because you can make images with captions doesn't mean every image should be a, a, an image that you tap for captions. Think about it and use it correctly. Think about it and use it sparingly because users don't want, necessarily want the interactivity. And if you do it wrong, um, Facebook is always calling. So. Since I have to believe I practice what I preach, this entire presentation or a larger version of this presentation is a supplemental interactive ebook available at emerson.box.com slash papercasting. So you can go and you can actually see all four of those examples I've done um, in slideshow form that you can tap because it's an interactive ebook. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Rudd's Villa, and I have a Tumblr called foxholeformat.tumblr.com that I created for my interactive, uh, advanced interactive ebooks class where we discussed most of these issues and worked through uh, paper casting, worked through storyboarding, worked through responsive design, worked through a lot of what you're talking about today. So um, that's it, and I'm happy to answer any questions. It's kind of a future-focused question. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen Myers, W3C. We work across many different industries, and it's fascinating to see uh, the approaches and the perspectives, and I very much enjoyed this. In the entertainment industry, I'm wondering when you think the convergence is coming to the ebook, where there is just going to be a different bar of expectation around interactivity. When the devices are interactive, we get that. But as far as I know, like Amazon, as far as I know, doesn't support JavaScript. Um, I'd bring up Nook, but I don't know how to bring up Nook now. I don't. <laughs> Do we care about Nook? This month, yes, unless we're British, no. Um, Do we care about Kobo? Kobo doesn't have interactivity. So until the actual software supports JavaScript. We're talking about iBooks. And again, this is, this is my guilt. Like, I'm not talking about most eBooks. I'm only talking at this point about iBooks and Redium's um, attachment on Chrome. But if, you know, Redium does become a model that eBook readers or tablets use, then we're going to be talking about it a lot more than we are now. Um, we're going to have the ability to transmit that across almost all industries, uh, almost all distributors so that people can use it. But now we're talking about Apple. So I feel safe saying it's years out. So, you know, we, we can develop this and get good practice so when it does happen, we're ready for it. Um, I was just wondering if in your own research or in some of the research you discussed, whether there's any differences in terms of age and, use of, uh, and the way that people interact in this kind of testing. I don't know of, again, most of the research I've, I've seen, they've never discussed age. Mm -hmm. Most of my own research has, oh, has been, you know, 
college students. Yeah. So I can't say if you know at a certain you know above a certain age group that the the interaction changes. Okay, I was just thinking of the Snapchat divide specifically. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah, and that's why I was like, <laughs> what, how do I answer? And I'll just answer yeah. honestly. It's like, I have no idea because, yeah, you think about Snapchat, you think yeah. about all those apps where it's, if you're over 30, you have no idea how this works. It's not for you. I don't even know how it works. <laughs> but yes, I mean, but I don't see that. And, and my feeling is, um, if that comes up, it's, we've got to make sure we're not Snapchat, that it's yeah. a book. Everyone needs to be able to use a book. Yeah. Not everyone needs to use Snapchat, okay. even though Snapchat would not want us to say that. But <laughs> I won't tell them. 